welcome everyone to this session. I consider, I mean, of course, we had lots of wonderful sessions already, but uh, I consider it one of the most important ones as it uh, says something about the future of Clarin. Because we're today, we're going to see uh, um, uh, really great examples of um, of the work currently being uh, carried out by uh, student PhD students uh, using uh, Clarin infrastructure, and uh, I think it's important for us for two reasons. I mean, one reason is that it shows us what actually is, uh, is being used and what's what's important for uh, for uh, users in our community. And secondly, it shows broader audiences how um, how um, Clarin tools could be applied uh, in different spheres. And you'll see uh, how the scope of the uh, of presentation is pretty uh, broad today. So you'll see um, uh, how different fields could be covered by by the work with the use of uh, of the Clarion infrastructure. Um, so, um, and uh, before the meeting, we uh, actually we 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 tried to to use the system that we will be sharing uh, each other presenter screen, but uh, it seems that it works better. I mean, you're looking at this conference, it works better that we have uh, one presentation shared by the moderator, and it also gives me more let's say influence on timing and timing is pretty strict so i'll be sharing my screen and uh, um, and we'll uh, flip slides for uh, for the presenters and I, I must also say that i'll be pretty strict with time because we have uh, we have lots of uh, um, uh, presentations and not so much time we'll have discussion after um, first uh, few uh, presentations and then another one in the end so i encourage everyone in the audience to ask your Questions in the chat window because it's also easy to gather um, gather the feedback and then uh, we, we, we may address it in the short discussion section. So without further ado, I will just ask uh, the first presenter to uh, um, uh, to, to come forward. Uh, that will be Laria, Laura Picchio, uh, who holds a master's degree in modern languages uh, for international communication and cooperation from the University of Maserata in Italy. Uh, where she also works uh, as the exam committee member and adjunct professor in English language and translation. Currently, she's a first year PhD student at the same university and doing PhD course in humanities and technologies uh, in the Department of Humanities. And her research project, as we will see soon, uh, deals with the film festival interpreting a new uh, media. So, uh, Laura, could you take over? Thank you very much. And I, the countdown begins, five minutes. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, it's a great pleasure for me to be here with you today. It's a great honor. So uh, the presentation is entitled The Film Festival Interpreting Corpus Project. And as the title uh, suggests, uh, my project deal with, deals with film festival interpreting, uh, namely dialogue consecutive interpreting between Italian and English performed live in film festivals and focusing in particular on the Gifoni Film Festival, one of the most popular international film festivals in Italy. And it addresses a youth audience made entirely of um, children and young people aged three to over, over 18 years old, uh, coming from Italy and from all over the world. Uh, these interpretations are performed live in real time and they are also live streamed. Therefore, I have to analyze and take into consideration two audiences, namely the flesh and blood spectators plus a remote audience uh, following the live streaming. I've decided to take into consideration this uh, context because it is an under-investigated set of professional practice and it allows me to approach, to analyze the digital turn we are experiencing today. I aim to create a spoken bilingual corpus and uh, carry out a multimodal analysis, uh, namely uh, focusing on the transcriptions, so the verbal component, and, uh, but also on the audio and or video clips I have collected. Um, I will analyze in particular the audience design, the ethics of entertainment, and uh, as I said before, the impact of the live streaming on these interpretations. Next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, the data collection is almost over. I've collected authentic audio and video clips uh, of the Gifoni Film Festival from 2017 to 2020. Therefore, my corpus is composed of the traditional versions of Digifoni plus the COVID virtual version of 2020, which has obviously its own 
features and characteristics. And the live streaming has become of paramount importance. The next step is represented by the data transcription. Uh, I'm at, currently testing and working with two uh, softwares that are extensively used in interpreting studies, therefore in my uh, own field, but they are also part of, let's say, the Clarin universe. Uh, I'm referring to Ilan and Exmeralda. Ilan has, has been developed by the Max Planck Institute for Psycholinguistics, uh, while Exmeralda is being developed by the Hamburger Zentrum für Sprachkorpora together with the archive uh, for German, uh, spoken German. They are Clarion B certified centers and Ilan is part of the Dutch consortium of Clarin, Exmeralda is, let's say, based in Germany. Uh, they are excellent resources and I'm actually uh, decided, deciding which one is the best for my own purposes of analysis. Next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, I think that the link between my project and Clarin can be found not only um, as far as the softwares are concerned, therefore um, at the, let's say, operative level, but also as far, uh, as far as the output of my project is concerned, namely the corpus itself. Uh, if we compare my corpus to the Clar ex existing Clarin resource families, I think that my corpus can be defined obviously as a spoken corpus because I work with oral data, with dialogic interpreter mediated data, two languages are involved, namely Italian and English, and I aim to analyze the transcriptions with uh, audio and or video clips. But I think that I think that my corpus can be defined also as a computer mediated communication corpus, in particular, as far as this virtual version is concerned, because um, in 2020, um, I have to analyze not only the remote audience following the traditional live streaming, but also the distance interpreting. Uh, let, therefore, the cases in which uh, the interpreters and or the guests were remote themselves. And so the live streaming is of paramount importance. Uh, no streaming, no G-phony. Uh, so next slide, please. Last one. one minute left. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so my purpose is a work in progress. And uh, I will uh, decide which software I'll, I will use. And uh, thank you very much. Thank you so much for the great presentation and of course for, for the great timing for the, <laughs> both things which are both important. And please, uh, we were collecting the questions in, in, uh, in the chat. Uh, so without further ado, let us move to the next presentation. Um, which is uh, um, um, Juliusz Słowacki's Literary and Romantic Irony by Anna uh, Mędrzecka. And uh, Anna is a PhD student at the Institute of Literary Research of the Polish Academy of, uh, of Sciences, which, which, where she currently follows the uh, PhD program in, uh, in Digital uh, Humanities. Um, uh, and we can uh, also add that her main area of interest is focusing on irony, self referentiality and related phenomena in Polish Romantic uh, literature as reflected in this paper. So, Anna, the floor is yours, five minutes. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Uh, and thank you for having me here. Uh, as you already said, my uh, main area of interest is irony in Polish literature and uh, especially in the work of Juliusz Słowacki. Uh, who was uh, one of the greatest Polish uh, romantic uh, poets. In order to find this irony using digital tools, I first had to uh, create a corpus of uh, his work. The problem is that uh, we don't have any digital edition, so we had to uh, digitalize uh, all the printed works, uh, make them into text files. It was the first uh, part of the work, which uh, already created some problems because uh, most of the works uh, were not published by the author uh, while he was still alive, most of them were left in manuscript, uh, unfinished, uh, and it is really hard to distinguish um, which version we should uh, use in our uh, analysis. Um, so for the first step, we just took uh, all the work we could find, all the versions of every single piece, uh, and in uh, all it gave us, as you can see, 24 dramatic words, works, uh, nine philosophical works, uh, 261 letters and so on. Um, so it varies very much because every genre of work has its own uh, special special features. 
uh, as we uh, managed to create this big corpus, uh, we put it, of course, in, in Forex, uh, provided by Cladin. Um, and we met many uh, problems in creating something we could analyze or I could compare, because my aim is to analyze the whole over of Słowacki, not only single texts or single fragments or kinds of uh, genre. Uh, so it arose uh, many problems, how to choose which work to analyze or should I only analyze published works or only uh, manuscripts, for example, or can I only compare kind of uh, work with another work of the same kind? Mm. The size of uh, the work is also very varies very much because some of them are only like 100 words and other are several thousand or thousands of hundreds. Uh, so this created many problems. And for the time being, I created a number of subcorpora, uh, which I believe uh, contain uh, works that can be compared together uh, with uh, reliable results. Uh, I After that, I made a list of things I think that uh, can represent irony in the literature and can be uh, looked for uh, using digital tools. Uh, it, it, uh, this list contains, for example, contrasting different styles uh, and moods, like very funny and happy fragments, uh, close to pathetic or uh, very sad fragments. Mm, repetition sometimes with antithesis. Uh, this means also uh, the words that mean the same thing, but are not uh, looking or sounding the same. Uh, also rhyming proper names or any strange or new words in the Polish language, which was, which was really hard to find. Uh, literature about literature. It's something like uh, that uh, romantic irony is also uh, uh, very often referred as. Uh, writing about writing and literature about literature. So I'm here uh, to find this. I made a list of words like uh, poetry, writing, creating, uh, singing, because in 19th century Polish, it was uh, the same word for uh, poetry and for singing. Um, and I used those words to create a list uh, and to compare the words with one, one another, uh, the works, sorry, with one another. Uh, and to uh, try and search all those things from my list, I try to adapt uh, tools provided by Clarin, uh, like one LAM. One minute, yes, I'm just adding one minute. Left. Yeah, thanks. Like LAM for frequency lists, because uh, it appears that, for example, uh, some kind of pronouns or uh, other words are typical for the text that are more than are ironic than others. Uh, using Webster for uh, stylometry or so-called stylometry analysis, uh, this is, for example, this list of the words uh, about poetry or about writing. Uh, I'm using also there uh, to find uh, autotelic or autothematic parts uh, of the text. And I'm trying to use WordNet to find repetitions, the kind of I was talking about, which means not only the words that look and sound the same, but the words that have the very similar meaning, they are close to one another, um, and they might uh, change the meaning of whole fragment in such way. So I think for now, this is it. If you have any questions, I'm happy to talk to you later. Thank you very much. Thank you, Raj. Again, this is a perfect timing. So thank you so much for, um, for, for these presentations and we look forward to your uh, questions. So let us move to the next presentation. And so I'm just working on three screens now to <laughs> accommodate it, but it's, it works, it works, that's good. Uh, so the next presentation is uh, the Mnemosyne language tool towards the creation of a new lexical resource for a knowledge model in cultural heritage by uh, Harriet uh, Clifton and who's an archaeologist from the UK with a background in Bronze Age, Cypriot archaeology. And she's currently studying as a PhD fellow with the EU uh, ERI chair Mnemosyne project, which focuses on the three digitization of cultural heritage objects, monuments, and sites. So Harriet, the floor is yours. Thank you. And thank you for the opportunity to uh, do this presentation today. Um, so the tool we're looking at developing um, with contributions from several PhD and postdoctoral fellows within the framework of the Eritrean Nemesini project, which, as we've already said, looks at the holistic documentation and digitization of cultural heritage. Uh, moving on to the next slide. Sorry. 
Um, in order to develop a lexi the lexical tool, uh, we've made the following considerations. Um, so the first is to give tangible cultural heritage assets a voice, um, to record the power data, metadata and data needed to holistically digitize cultural heritage assets and produce a holistic knowledge, uh, to evaluate the grammar and semantic rules required to support this, uh, to interrelate the vocabularies and thesauri to support the knowledge management systems, um, to identify the requirements needed for uh, the user needs, so to really kind of engage with what the community needs when um, digitizing knowledge. And then moving on to the next slide, um, we're also considering um, how we can develop an integrated taxonomy of both movable and immovable objects into an ontology to support the relationships between data sets, the complexity of characteristics of the assets and the embedded intangible heritage with the aim to contribute to the Clarion infrastructure in the form of a monolingual glossary for the classification of cultural heritage objects, monuments and sites. Okay, moving on to the next slide, thank you. Um, so, so far we're developing the first stages because at the beginning of the project, really, um, of the classification and working on both movable and immovable separately for the time being to be integrated at a later stage when we've reached that um, level. Okay, so the next slide. Uh, the movable classification is divided into five broad categories at the moment. So instruments and manufacture, wearables, transports, communication supports and fixtures and fittings. This will then be subdivided depending on some criteria that I'll discuss later in this presentation. The next slide um, looks at the immovable classification, which is currently divided by terrestrial or underwater, then whether it's a monument or site, whether it's a cultural, natural or mixed kind of heritage site, and then by function, significance and component. Then moving on to the next and uh, final slide, um, we're looking at the different criteria that we've outlined so far for what information we need to gather to input into this knowledge management system and lexical tool to really um, support this holistic view of cultural heritage assets. So the first criteria that we've identified is the function. This is the technical capability of an object. It's kept quite broad at um, this stage and then refined further to be more specific as one of the challenges which we've been trying to overcome is the complexity of an object. Um, an object, monument or site is not restricted to one functional material. So by keeping the categories fairly broad, all, as, all assets could be input into it and then further developed based on the wide range of physical variables, more specific purposes and contexts that we can develop later. The second category we identified was form. As in the case of function, this is represented or will be represented through several le levels within the classification and taxonomy in order to narrow in and become more specific. It covers a general typologies, such as in the case of jewelry, for example, where you've got necklaces, bracelets or pendants, but then um, narrowing in on more specific typologies. So like in the case of necklaces where you've got a choker or a collar, um, so it's based on existing terminologies. We're not trying to reinvent the wheel. Um, and then the third category we've identified is subject type. This is tied to a specific purpose that separates the asset from other, other um, of a similar physical form. It's a physical re representation of an, intang an intangible element or a communication about the asset. For example, if we take the um, idea of a signet ring, it's a ring, but it also contains a personal motif or an administrative motif or religious or so on. But then it has more than just the purpose of a ring. It can also be imprinting a motif into wax, for example. Okay. One okay. minute, one minute. Thank you. Uh, the next category is material and technique. Um, this is fairly self-explanatory, so I won't go into a huge amount of detail here, but it's a good touch point to connect and interconnect data together. The same could be said of location and context. Um, so this covers the period of production and use, the socio-cultural and geographical context, and requires the development of a wider knowledge network to support the metadata and paradata connected and collected throughout this process and connected into this point, really. And then finally, we're looking at the state and condition of the asset. 
This includes the physical condition, um, so how well it's been preserved over time, but can also be like the use and reuse of an object. So how it um, may have had an extended life cycle through the mending of it or the remanufacturing of it. So how can we map that knowledge into a new tool to support the life and story of a heritage asset? Um, and this sort of brings us to the end of this presentation. There was meant to be a video that hasn't um, <laughs> worked, but uh, which highlighted the um, complexity of a wonderful example here on Cyprus of the Asinu Church, which has a highly complex level of frescoes, building elements, um, as well as yeah. the intangible. So thank you. Yeah, thank you. And I'm sorry, because I also realized just right now that I'm, after downloading, we lost the picture. I, I didn't yeah. dare to click uh, just <laughs> not to break anything. I mean, just to do, because it could take us you know, away from the presentation on Zoom is always um, pretty risky. But uh, I think we, we will be sharing the presentations later. We can fix it in the in Google Doc and who showed a uh, picture. So sorry for that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, uh, okay, uh, without further ado, we are really uh, those virtual conferences really badly pace, and we we need to move forward. Uh, so um, the next presentation um, uh, would be dedicated to building a French-Spanish online digital dictionary specialized in architecture, uh, and it will be delivered by Zaida uh, Bartolome Diaz. And um, uh, she's a civil engineer from uh, the ULPGC. She also has a degree in translation and interpretation from this university, uh, from the, the Gran Canaria. And she's currently a PhD student in, in the doctorate program in linguistics and literary studies in their social cultural contexts uh, at the University of Las Palmas, the uh, Gran Canaria. Um, uh, his, sorry, I'm sorry, uh, his thesis is mainly about specialized dictionaries in architecture, in particular French, Spanish, and how a Lambda user can create a new specialized bilingual and connected resource. So, Zaida, the floor is yours. Thank you. Hey, uh, hello, everybody, and thank you very much for, me, for giving me this opportunity to be here. I'm going to introduce uh, my, my work. So the first post of my uh, PhD work is to show how specialized bilingual dictionary have been truly overlooking in national geography. And for this reason, we start with an historical overview that allows us to study and retrace the different stage of lexicography with a focus on our case study, namely Spanish French dictionaries. So thanks to our research, we can show that the system lexicographic resources dedicated to technical language that no, do not use English as a uh, access language are very scarce. And to solve this lack, uh, the second objective of our work is the creation of an extract. We are going to try to create an extract of a French Spanish bilingual dictionary for the domain of, of our Czech architecture. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, we define a methodology. Uh, first step, we are going to select a corpus and given the evident lack of specialized corpus in the field of uh, architecture, the first step is to obtain specific uh, corpora for both Spanish and, and French language. Uh, this corpora must be specialized and are up to date to say that they show included the most recent terms in the sector. And for this reason, we decided to create our own corpora, domain corpora starting from web data. Uh, using the corpus creation tools offered by Sketch uh, Engine from the project Alexis. Uh, we have built our corpora for a specific uh, search of the web. So for friend, we use the search query based of terms contained in French term related to the domain uh, habitat and construction in the architecture. And we finally form a French corpus uh, made up with uh, 82 documents. Uh, for the Spanish corpus, uh, science and equivalent of French term wasn't available. We use it as sketch engine again, and we crawled the content of an online portal specializing in Spanish architecture, Plataforma Arquitectura, and we find a former Spanish corpus made up with 65 documents. Next slide, please. So we provide then a terminology, terminological extraction, and for each of these created corpus, and using again the sketch engine tool, we perform a terminological extraction. And as a result, we obtain a series of representative architectural terms for each of these uh, language. Uh, next slide, please. 
uh, then uh, we create a draft dictionary for this term. We would have transferred them to the lexic Lexonomy Dictionary Editor. Uh, today, entries have been created for this 20 term, as well as def definition, translation, cross-reference, and links to external resources. And the data can be downloaded from Lexonomy. Uh, next slide, please. But uh, we have had to face uh, several problems, um, uh, mostly related to the fair to adapt the Lexonomy native format in order to convert it to a standard format, which is a limit to the reusability of the lexicon and to its deposit of language research repositories. Uh, more specifically, Lexonomy does not propose a format that can be shared or adapted to the DEI LNF serialization, which also prevents data from being shared or published on other platforms. And similarly, the resource in Lexonomy cannot be connected to the link is linked open data. So uh, next slide, please. Um, the future perspective and of storage and publications on the use of uh, sketch engineering and Lexonomy in an academic context is promoted and encouraged by the Alexic project. However, besides uh, of the limitation that we already said, the possibility to use an European initiative does not uh, represent an lasting solution uh, other alternatives or development to the Alexis infrastructure may, uh, may be uh, necessary. So the initiative proposed uh, by Alexis are currently free of charge, of course, and can be used to house an electronic resource, but uh, will this uh, structure continue to be free in the near future? Uh, we believe that the long-term solution shall be offered, in particular, to support not commercial player and institution. Uh, and it's uh, therefore essential to develop a new dictionary content in relation to the new technological tool, but it's also essential to guarantee a free infrastructure to different stakeholders adapted to established formats and that allows uh, for the hosting and connecting of the different electronic resources created. So in this sense, uh, we believe that clearing can offer possible solution and I'm here to, to know uh, more about uh, clearing and what the Clarin can, can offer what the uh, tools can, can offer and, can, and I can use it for my, my project. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much, Saida, for, for this one. And this paper concludes our like first part of the uh, of the presentation. And so there's now there's a quick chance to ask some questions to uh, to those presentations. We we in the chat window, I just see the questions from Daria, which are just which are quite. Uh, uh, general in terms of how Claren can help you, but perhaps there's another, anybody has a question uh, concerning the the content of the presentation or, or some follow-ups. And of course, you know that afterwards you can join the presenters in their uh, rooms to, uh, to to discuss uh, the poster and style, to discuss their work. Uh, and I I think I don't see any question, uh, any hands risen. So just let's let us uh, Perhaps I would use this way that we'll just move with uh, the, far, the, the rest of the presentation, so we're sure we're, we'll be doing good on, on time. And in the end, we'll just ask some of, those, of, of some of those general questions to all the uh, presenters to keep up the, the pace, because I know that there's another section, session waiting for us um, after, uh, after we finish. So uh, let us move to, uh, to the next presentation then. Uh, uh, that would be a contrastive study of management science, a thesis summary text in English and Latvian by Iveta Kopartina. Uh, and uh, um, uh, just uh, my third screen, I Iveta is a PhD student in her last year of studies at the University of Liepaja at Latvia. Uh, and she works as a researcher at uh, Ventspils University of Applied Sciences. For approximately seven years, uh, she has also worked with Bavarian management science doctoral students at the University of Latvia, both translating their PhD summaries and consulting them. So now uh, share your experiences uh, with, with that, uh, uh, how, how that translates into your uh, research and five minutes. Hello everyone. Thank you very much for having me here. And I would like to start with a question. So as PhD students, uh, how many of you have had this very nagging feeling at the last moment, oh, I, I, I need a consultation from somebody? Well, I have been working with Bavarian PhD students for seven years. And uh, the form of communication is either usually email 
or phone. And that's by far not enough. So I decided to help them even more. Well, my functions are to translate the English texts into Latvian and to edit the English texts, as well as to suggest different things that should be put into the PhD summary and uh, see what's lacking, actually, and also correct the most horrible mistakes. So, and I decided, next slide, please, uh, to help my students. And as Ken, Ken Highland has said, yeah, it is, of course, very important to note uh, that English is a lingua franca in uh, science, in the language of science. And uh, my students uh, do not have English as their native language, they have German. But Ken Highland has said that different science language text types, including dissertations and their summaries, are central to the academic enterprise and are the very stuff of education and knowledge creation. And Ken Highland is one of those authors I respect very much. He's from the University of East Anglia, and I think everybody knows him. Uh, so I started to look for projects in Latvia that could help my students. I had an approximate idea what I could do for them. And I found two. I found language and structure of Latin scientific texts, which was carried out by the University of Ventspils. And right now I'm participating also in that project, Interlingual Aspects of the Latin Scientific Language. However, they're both monolingual projects. Uh, the study is about the Latin language and not about English. And I was quite sure that I needed both. So we had also a course for doctoral students on the tools of Clary, and I joined that with pleasure. That was organized in cooperation with the Institute of Mathematics and Computer Science of the University of Latvia. Next slide, please. And I have to note here that in in-depth research in the language of science started only in the 90s of the last century. And it's, so I was very lucky to find uh, those uh, people who were working with the theme, but uh, management science PhD have not yet been studied in depth. And the aim of my study is to research the respective texts and to facilitate the process of writing and translation of those. Next slide, please. So as you can see, for German students, when they start studying for their PhD in Latvia, there are very huge issues to be resolved. First of all, the conventions are different from their home university, languages other than native, and immediate consultation is not available. There are also translation issues. There is the reform of doctoral studies going on. And of course, there is COVID-19 crisis which makes all of us work remotely. Next slide, please. And here you can see the most horrible mistakes I have discovered, luckily not from that corpus that I'm taking care of, but from the one where people translate into English. And as you can see, the mistakes are really huge. And this is from already defended thesis. So you can imagine what my reaction is when I see such things. Next slide, please. And one minute left. Yeah, and I studied uh, two parallel corpora, 50 texts, original texts in, Lat uh, in English translations into Latvian, uh, written from uh, 2013 to 2020. And uh, actually, uh, the study is representative because it covers 98% of the whole stuff. Next slide, Next slide please. And the relevance is what I have studied, micro and macro structure and uh, wording with Antkong. Analysis of terms, elements denoting the author's stance. It's very important. Next slide, please. And who will benefit? Doctoral students, first of all, translators, academic community, and the last slide, please. What's the outcome? What's the meaning for the Clarin project? So what's meaning for the students inclusion of the study, hopefully, of the results into Clarion Repository. It was started in March 220. Information for doctoral students and translators, information for scientists, examples of recurring mistakes. And of course, it, I hope, will serve as a foundation for further research. Thank you.
thank you for this uh, project. This seems to be double relevant for PhD sex session as also it works. I hope it is. Material. <laughs> okay. Uh, thank you so much. And let's move to, um, to, to, to our um, uh, next presentation, which is cross-linguistic influence and cognitive processing in bi and multilinguals, uh, a parallel corpus and experimental study by Alina Tsikolina from the uh, University of Lille. And just let me briefly introduce Alina to you. So she's a PhD student at the University of Lille and last year she received her master's degree in language and corpus linguistics with the highest honors. During her master's thesis research she investigated the cross-linguistic influence of L1 and L2 in late French English bilinguals. Currently she is working under the supervision of associate professor Eva Saroli uh, on the cognitive implications of L2 and L3 acquisition from a psycholinguistic perspective. So um, Alina, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much. So today I'm presenting my PhD project on cross-linguistic influence and cognitive processing in B and multilinguals, a parallel corpus and experimental study. Next slide, please. Uh, imagine that you have to describe the scene where a person is walking across the street in a crossroad with much traffic and several traffic lights. An English speaker would say something like this, this road is difficult to cross. A French speaker sometimes like something like this, this road is difficult to cross. So they both use a specific class of predicate with a construction where the syntactic subject, this road, is also an object of the infinitive to cross. So here the adjective difficult is applied to the whole infinitive sentence, leaving a gap, we call such constructions tough constructions, and the particular encoding strategy, a gap strategy. The problem is that there is no direct equ equivalent in Russian. So in this language, speakers need to say something like this road difficult cross or this road is difficult for crossing, where we have a non-stative strategy with case marking and a strategy with the use of the, the verbal complement respectively. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, no, no, it's before that. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, no, the next one. <laughs> yeah, okay, thank you, thank you. Uh, so um, a different asymmetry exists in the encoding of a special com components in semantics. So for instance, to describe the scene on your right, uh, a French speaker has to say, uh, he ascends the stairs by running. Uh, so here we see that the uh, path is encoded in the verb and the, the manner of the motion is lived in the periphery. Uh, while in English, the speaker needs to say he's running up the stairs. So here we see it is a little bit different because the manner of motion is encoded in the verb and the path is encoded uh, in a particle. Uh, a Russian uh, would say something like uh, he up run by stairs so here again, we see that in the verb, we have the, man, the manner of motion and in the prefix, uh, which is attached to the verb, we see uh, the, uh, the path. So we observe that in this case, English and Russian behave in a similar way, but French opts for a different lexicalization strategy. The question is how speakers organize such types of information in discourse and how they deal cognitively with such asymmetries, especially when they learn a second, third or third language that has a very different semantic or syntactic strategy. Next slide, please. Uh, in order to explore the impact of such asymmetries, we opt for both corpus and experimental comparison. Corpus data comparison with data sets through the Clarin VLO platform, combined with a variety of experimental offline and online measures. More specifically, the project capitalizes on existing language database available through, through Clarin certificate centers, BC and K centers like the TalkBank and the Autolink databases, but also offer to enrich the infrastructure with new open access and interoperable bilingual and trilingual corpora that will be collected within the experimental protocol aligned not only with audio and video, but also coupled with the eye tracking and reaction time, time data. This triangulation will help investigate the relative impact of language independent and language specific factors on verbal and nonverbal processing of monolingual, bilingual and trilingual speakers, and thus provide deeper insights into the relation between language and thought 
and further contribute in the domain of corpus and cognitive linguistics, as well in the field of the second and third language acquisition and teaching. So thank you very much. And uh, if you want to know a little bit more about the study, you can join me through Zoom in the poster session. Thank you. Thank you so much also for great discipline with the timing and uh, um, uh, and yes, yeah, for, for the fabulous um, presentation. Um, let's just have the last one before before the uh, the question time and we'll have more time to, to for, for, for general uh, discussion. So, um, so our last uh, but not least, of course, uh, speaker is uh, Mateusz Gniewkowski uh, from uh, Wrocław University of Science and Technology, whose research is uh, uh, focused on data analysis in cybersecurity. And since, since he started to work at uh, Claring PL, he also deals with national lang natural language processing uh, on everyday uh, basis. So in Claring, he's responsible for the development and maintenance of publicly available services. And the idea for these presentations came from the fact that he uh, would like to be able to improve the readability of the results for all researchers using their platform. And Mateusz is the uh, second year PhD student. So Mateusz, the floor is yours. Yes, hello, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, I was worried that I messed with my options. Okay, so, well, the topic is about the quality of dimensional reduction algorithm, and that's quite different from every other presentation I've heard today, uh, but not, maybe not, not so. So I will try to explain you what it is about in the next slides, please. <laughs> Okay, so when you play with tools on our website, and uh, actually every other tools uh, connected with natural language processing, you can usually see those kinds of plots. This is basically to the representation of a corpus, so each dot represents a document. And uh, the, the, the reason I do my research is to um make those pictures those plots better what does it mean better the sample so every document should be close to 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 to, to each other if they are in the same group and far away from from the other groups and there are a few problems with this and i will present you a short uh, basic solution that i'm currently working on to to, to improve this uh, next slide please so uh, what the researchers usually do is that when they have some high dimensional data representing documents, for example, 300 um, numbers uh, per each, they're using some methods called um, uh, PCA or kernel PCA. Those methods are responsible for dimensional reduction. Uh, most of them have uh, plenty of hyperparameters, so the the, the and parameters area and the solution area is quite wide and you need to uh, just researchers that just try a few of them and and oh this picture this plot looks well so i'm going to put it in my in my article what well, this is not the best solution that we can uh do so the big question is which method and combination of hybrid patterns i should choose to obtain the most accurate the, the, the best looking uh, plots and the answer is on the next slide um you can actually try to do something like grid search so it's exhaustive search of every solution uh, but for that you need to have some comparing methods so um, so a score uh, so for every um, possible combination of, um, of methods and hyperparameters you just uh, generate those plots and then you can try to just use some clustering methods in the lower space like uh, agglomerative clustering or cummings for example and then you need to compare the result with a grand truth. So this is quite important, and I thought you should say before I, I started to explain everything, that the data and the solution should be labeled. Of course, you can try to cluster in the higher space, but it's not necessarily gives you the correct result. I mean, correct that the distances in the higher space are preserved in the lower space. Uh, Two measures of symmetry between clustering, probably the most famous one, most commonly used, are adjusted trend, uh, adjusted trend index, and this is probably uh, the easier to understand and adjusted mutual information. So next slide, please. Hello? Okay. So I tested the, the, this algorithm on two data sets. Uh, first one is uh, just the Wikipedia. 
10,000 documents and others, let's call it press, six and a half thousand of documents. This is the most important uh, hallmarks you need to know. And on the next picture, on the next slide, um, Okay, I have some actual results. So um, those uh, plots represent the, the Wiki data sets um, and the, the, the reduction was done by uh, TSNE algorithm with uh, you know, several uh, hyperparameters, a lot of them actually. And the, the scores show you um, how good it looks for a human, I, I mean, it's supposed to. Uh, so the lower it's a, uh, the problem is basically that the, the, some samples are really far away from the center, so it's like the picture is small and you actually can cannot see what's what's inside, what what what's going on in the center. The second one, the groups overlap, and the third one with the highest score. I know it's not a one, but it's zero point fifty six is the highest score that, that I can and I, I could obtain. Uh, the groups are quite well separated. Uh, each group, of course, looks in some class of documents uh, given a priori. So it's, uh, for example, sports on or media. I, it's nothing really important. Um, okay, the next slide uh, shows uh, the result for the other data sets. I've tested the solution for several more, but, but I, since I have only have five minutes, but I show this. Uh, the problem with this data set um, is that um, the violet group is actually divided into um, several subgroups and this means and that the algorithm, is, um, thank you uh, not always will work but in this example works quite um, quite well next slide please uh, so to do this but I'm not going to read all of this since I have less than one minute but though some topics that the problems that that in this work will probably I need to face, but I think this is a good start point for discussion at the, at the poster style discussion later on. So the next slide is uh, my final slide and thank you for your attention, thank you for having me. Uh, thank you, thank you very much uh, um, for, for this presentation and for all of the presentation and a special thank you to all the presenters for, for really great preparation and, and, and sticking to time and, and delivering their uh, points uh, pretty clearly, so I'm I'm really also impressed by the uh, but not also not only by the breadth of the uh, uh, of the those projects, but also of the uh, ability to um, deliver it into such a short times. And now we'll let us move to the uh, to the let's say the Q and A part of it. So I would ask all the presenters if they don't have anything uh, against it to uh, turn on their cameras, and we'll just have a quick uh, conversation for. Uh, approximately 11 minutes, which are left in our, before we move to the future session. Um, so, uh, so yeah, oh, Mateusz, you turned off, but actually, if you, you could just turn your camera back on, that would be awesome. But also, I think Daria wants to take a picture of uh, of the panel, so that's another <laughs> another reason. Uh, so, um, uh, are there any uh, questions to, so far from the from the uh, from the participants, from other participants from the audience, I don't see anything. Um, if not, I will just try to uh, ask you, uh, uh, and it will be a general question to all of you, and you can take them. Uh, who, whoever feels uh, uh, like answering it, uh, that would be a slightly modified question of Daria asked in the chat. So about actually your sort of experience as. Uh, in the PhD students. Uh, oh, and I'll just stop sharing the screen. I wanted to do that. Uh, well, but, oh, I stopped. Okay, perfect. Uh, so your experience about uh, as, as PhD students, but also um, it, it's, it's also especially interesting for me to see how sort of uh, uh, doing uh, this kind of digital humanities work uh, changes over time in the sense that um, you're and your PhD students right now. So do you feel that it's sort of kind of easier right now to do this kind of work or do you still have any problems? What do you think would be your recommendation for, you know, uh, for, for the students who just start to this stuff like, uh, and how to grasp what interdisciplinary um, fields and what Clarion also can do to help you. So this is like a big package, basically directed at your experience as PhD students. So, uh, who would like to go first? Anyone? Well, probably I would like to say something yeah. possible. Yeah, sure, go ahead, go ahead. 
Well, first of all, I would really suggest uh, to all those who start right now to join Clarion as soon as possible, because that's a great opportunity to really share knowledge and also to learn. And the sooner the students get acquainted with the tools Clarion actually can provide, the better is for the students. That's all I wanted to say. Thank you. And how about uh, others, your experiences in, in bridging those whatever two areas to try to do um, more quantitative work with um, some humanities questions uh, as in some of the presentations? What would you say about that? What would you say to others who want to do that? If I can say something, um, I would suggest sure. that in general, uh, I think that a PhD student uh, has to um, be ready to tackle difficulties and be ready to find also B plans. Because, uh, for example, in my case, I had to readjust, uh, in particular, the uh, data collection because of the pandemic. So uh, I would say that a PhD student has to uh, be ready to to tackle difficulties, deal with uh, something that uh, is new and, uh, you know, it can be very difficult to overcome. And um, I think that uh, interdisciplinary is the key word now. And so uh, do not focus just on uh, your field. For example, in my case, interpreting studies, but be open to uh, an inter interdisciplinary approach, for example, computational linguistics, corpora, uh, corpora linguist corpus linguistics, but also in my case, for example, digital studies. So this. Thank you. And also, I think there's also one thing you were mentioning is like um, supervision or supervisors. You, you may have, of course, I don't want to ask you about your direct supervisors. You don't have to answer that. But, but uh, in general, people doing uh, this kind of work you do, um, do you feel that, you, uh, that it's easy actually to get, uh, um, get the support of your institutions, like in terms of methodology of, you know, of those interdisciplinary uh, work? Or is it still something to... Uh, um, to work on, and, and also I'm thinking of it in terms of Clarin, which also gives a kind of uh, um, uh, know-how in, in, in those cases, if you actually feel, if, if, you, if you like uh, some senior staff to uh, mm -hmm. advise you on certain methodological steps. So how do you, uh, uh, how do you think about that support you, you people doing such work may be getting in their institutions? I had to reply or someone? Uh, I mean, someone if else. you wish, go no, for okay. it. Somebody else would like. You <laughs> no, no, no. I leave the floor to, to someone else so they can speak. Unless it's to. Well, if I may again. Sure, please. Yeah, go for it. Well, first of all, can I? Uh, yeah. First yeah, of yeah. all, I would be the first one to ask for a mentor. Because I would really want, uh, I would really like to use all the features I possibly can. I currently have um, two corpora, each containing 25 texts. I need to put them together. And for me, wordsmith wouldn't be enough. I want something better. And not only that, I want my students to really benefit from the results. And I want to know more about how can I do it in what format I will do it and that will happen. But I need a good mentor. And mm -hmm. my project finishes in November, which yeah. means I will also need funding. Yeah. So it's all very important. So anybody else would like also to add something to this one, this point? In terms of uh, finding support and mentors, I must say that uh, my cooperation with Clarin, especially with uh, uh, Wrocław, Politechnika Wrocławska, is something that uh, it's, uh, it's amazing for me, really, because uh, every question I have for them is answered, and it's answered right away. Mm, and uh, every tool I need to adjust, uh, I also get the, the answer 
the same day if it's possible. And if they can do it, they do it really, really quickly. So it's something I've never experienced really at the university, especially. Uh, so I'd like to thank them very much. And uh, I think that's great. And I also like the, uh, the, the person before me uh, said, I also think that uh, getting into Clarin uh, environment is something that any PhD student interested in this kind of research should do as soon as it's possible. I have the same experience. So, yes, if I can say something. Sure, sure, go ahead. <laughs> because uh, um, I came from a, a very little university, so I discovered Clarine and uh, all this uh, European structure when I came here to France, because I'm doing now a, a mobility um, program. So I, I would like to say that it's a, a very great opportunity and for, for every PhD student, I, I, it would be great if uh, you can develop uh, to every university in, uh, in uh, Europe, because there are still some universities they don't know uh, Clarin or, or other European infrastructure. So I think that's a great opportunity and uh, about the mentor, of course, they are, they are great. Uh, for me, uh, every time I have a question, they are, they are there. So uh, any problem with that, uh, it's, a, it's a great opportunity. And I, uh, I will encourage every student to to take part of this uh, infrastructure. Only thing that I think that, at least in Poland, I don't know about other countries, uh, could be changed is uh, the uh, approach to uh, other disciplines. Because I know that uh, still today at the, my uh, faculty uh, at the University of Warsaw, at the Polish Philology, they honestly don't, don't know anything about what we are doing here. Uh, maybe one or two person know something, but uh, in general, the students are not taught any uh, usage of digital tools or anything of this kind. And uh, I don't know if it is an institutional problem or maybe just it's that uh, the people who are interested in digital sciences uh, come and seek those kind of things and some just don't. And uh, it's, it's not, uh, I don't know, it's not an, of course, thing to do for them. And maybe it's the only thing that I think that could be changed. Thank you. And we, we have also a, like a quick question to Alina in the chat uh, from Andreas Witt. Uh, so you mentioned experiments you are about to start for your PhD project. Do you see possibilities for a research infrastructure like Clarin to support this activity? We don't have much time, so let's brief uh, brief answer and uh, okay. we can continue okay. later in the, uh, in yeah. the yeah. breakout yeah. rooms. Yeah. Uh, of course, as I said, so to prepare this experiment, so I need the correct data because I will use something this I, I, I can tell I can tell it in the zoom session afterwards so more in details and also as far as I know I can use also some tools for the transcriptions because I will have the oral da data and there will be a lot of data so it will be very nice to have uh, automated transcriptions at least for English and I know I can do it for French unfortunately for the moment I'm not quite sure for Russian but for these two languages also it will be very very useful. Uh, and also, I think there will be a lot of other opportunities what, which I can use. So I can describe it later then to answer fully to this question. Thank you. Thank you very much for the brief uh, response.